I'm going to speak on Neo Krishna Consciousness, which from the title you can guess it's going to be somewhat uh, polemic, maybe controversial. I don't really like to speak on these things. I wish I didn't feel that I have to. Uh, I've given coming on to 1,000 talks on Vishnu Sahasranama. That's what I really like to talk about. But seeing the movement that Srila Prabhupada set up going awry in various ways, I feel that at least sometimes I have to say something to distinguish what should be from what should not be to warn others who want to hear. Recently, I was at a, an ISKCON center in the United States of America. It's, uh, started by Indians, people of Indian origin, Hindus, run by Indians, for Indians. N nothing intrinsically wrong with it. I'm not criticizing that, but it is different to Previously, so when I talk about neo Krishna consciousness, I'm going to be talking about how it was when I joined, what I experienced, and what I experience now. And there are a lot of differences. Now, one thing I, it really struck me was that one of the devotees was wearing a t shirt in which in the center, it was written in Sanskrit, Atato Brahma Jignasa, the first aphorism among the Vedanta Sutras, which means now we, the ultimate reality should be re inquired into. And then surrounding that in English were written terms like compassion, harmony, empathy, I can't remember the others, goodwill, this and that. These qualities are byproducts of Brahma Jignasa. Someone who inquires into the ultimate reality is expected to develop such laudable qualities as compassion, empathy, and harmony. But it's not this central thrust of Brahma Jignasa. By emphasizing the secondary or the corollaries of Brahma Jignasa as primary, they hide the primary. And what's going on is without putting the spiritual, the Brahma, the yeah, Brahma means spiritual, that is which is to be inquired about, without defining that or without, of course, they're on a t-shirt, but the idea is that without putting, that is written in the center, but what's going on is that you're taking this, this spiritual formula and conflating it with mundane compassion, empathy, harmony. And with mundane compassion, empathy, harmony, come mundane lust, greed, and everything else. As long as we're not on the platform of Brahma, Brahma Bhuta, Prasanna Atma, as long as we're not happy on the fully spiritual platform, then we're going to be on the material platform. You're either on one or the other, or somewhere in between. Uh, but unless there's serious Brahma Jignasa, then we are going to mistake what can be seen as the mode of goodness, sattva guna, which is one of the modes of material nature which binds us in this material world. We're going to mistake that for being spiritual. Another thing I saw at that center was uh, a young boy, maybe early teens or 12, something 12 years old, something like this, reading an, ed an edition of the Ramayana or extracts, a book with the extracts from the Ramayana written by uh, an ISKCON devotee in which it's 
I looked at the book. It's taking from the Ramayana lessons for living in this world, but not emphasizing that Ram is the supreme personality of Godhead, or that devotion to him is what the readers of the Ramayana are supposed to imbibe. It's how to get life lessons for living in this world, how to get ahead in this world, how to be successful in this world. So there's a whole generation of devotees. That, it, it, I mean, the whole thing got me thinking that we, it's nothing new, it's not something sensational that happened overnight, but there's a, the whole direction of the present generation of devotees is like that. There's a blurry line between Krishna consciousness and new agey well-being, or maybe hardly any line at all. And then there are various Sahajya influences, which I'll talk about gradually, Krishna willing. Neo-Krishna consciousness. Things have changed in so many ways since Srila Prabhupada left. Uh, it's not necessarily bad that things have changed. Change is the very nature of this world. Uh, it's unrealistic and impossible to think that everything should be exactly the same as it was in the 1970s. And we don't want that because we we were immature in the 1970s. But ISKCON has ch changed in significant ways. I mean, there's so many ways. The movement has expanded in so much. The whole uh, former Soviet Union has opened up. Uh, but what I'm focusing on here is that devotees' attitude toward Krishna consciousness and their practice of Krishna consciousness and their understanding of Krishna consciousness has altered. It's different. Now, one major difference between ISKCON in the 1970s and ISKCON in the 2020s is that nowadays most initiated devotees are financially independent grihastas. They don't directly serve the mission full time. It may be just like that center I went into the USA. Like I said, it's f founded by Indians, run by Indians, for Indians, and it's basically a Sunday get together place, spiritual community center. And I'm not saying that's bad, but I'm just saying and pointing out that is different. Uh, but the very fact that we have a large movement, the majority of members who are grihastas with their worldly concerns, it does make a big difference in many ways. Uh, how we preach Krishna consciousness, uh, how we practice Krishna consciousness, because uh, those who are living not in the temples, they have a lot of challenges. Practically none of them have a full morning program like the devotees in the temple or evening program daily like that. And they're not full-time engaged in direct propagation of the mission. So it does make a lot of difference. But one difference that we don't want is mission drift. And what I'm talking about the differences here is that, okay, there will be differences, but we don't want to drift away, which, which is what happens. We, we drift away. It's not just in, in ISKCON, but we start to move away. We don't even notice it's happening from the, the very goals that the society was set up for. We, we don't notice it. It just slowly happens in course of time. That's called mission drift. It, it can be just something that happens. We don't really notice it and it happens. Or it can be intentional that, that some leaders especially sit down and think, hey, uh, we need to change some things here. And they do. 
So in this talk, or maybe series of talks, two or three talks, let's see how time takes us, uh, I'm going to mention some things which, in my vision, are not good changes. What I'm going to talk about doesn't apply to everyone, but widespread enough to be noticeable and a cause for concern. Scholars of religion, uh, or sociologists of religion, they know from Max Weber the concept of religious movements having a post-charismatic phase. In other words, they are started by a charismatic figure. Jesus, Muhammad, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in our case specifically talking about Iskon, Srila Prabhupada, and Max Weber noted that there is the routinization of charisma. You don't get the same verve and idealism and energy as when the charismatic founder was around and then everything has to be institutionalized. And naturally, it's just the way things happen. Well, not necessarily, but uh, it doesn't have to be like that. But Iskon is going through the spirit of going through the phase of uh, institutionalization, or very much in that phase, and we we can't expect it. It, it may be unrealistic to expect the same kind of fired up spirit that when Srila Prabhupada, that was there when Srila Prabhupada was present. Undeniably, there are many devotees throughout the world who are practicing very seriously, and I, I don't want to just label everyone with one brush, but still there are some prominent tendencies which are worrying. Um, many of the things that I'm going to talk about are applicable more to the West in the 1970s, ISKCON was booming in the West, and India was a struggle. Uh, spreading or establishing ISKCON in India was a struggle. I first came to India with the intention to stay in the 1970s, and it was a big struggle in many ways. Now it's around the other way. The, the real booming place for Krishna consciousness is for for. ISKCON as a movement and Krishna conscious is uh, India and the West seems to be more struggling and in many, of course, Russia and neighboring countries have come up. Uh, ISKCON in the West where it's doing relatively well, it's generally in places where there's a Indian population of, who have taken up Krishna consciousness uh, seriously and committed to it. So really it's shifted from being a, a, a Western-based movement to an increasingly Indian-based movement. <clears throat> the West was very vibrant, but still there are more temples and more centers, and in many ways the movement is more spread in the West than it was previously, although we don't have uh, temples with, with so many we don't have in the temples there are not so many devotees it, it's a struggle to run them on in, in some temples uh, at Mongolati there are more deities than devotees that's a, almost a cliche to say that now it used to be that Hare Krishna was a household word in the west but unfortunately it's largely unknown nowadays Temples, in the West especially, are no longer places to send out soldiers to fight with Maya. I'll read a letter from Srila Prabhupada about that shortly. Temples are, are, are more like churches or community centers which are visited on Sundays with only a skeleton crew of residents who keep the daily worship and the daily activities which aren't much, keep them running on 
In the West, temple presidents are often part-time. They have a job and they come in whenever they can or they're under a committee. Uh, or, yeah, if there may be a committee running the place. So temple presidents, if they still exist, seem to be expected by the congregation to make everything nice for them on Sunday. That's their main thing. They're, they're waiters serving prasadam. And this may be a subjective observation, but it seems that when we joined, those of us who joined in the 1970s, we were taught and, and inspired. The whole mood was to dedicate ourselves to Krishna. But it, it seems that many t devotees joining together are concerned first with their own comfort zone, and then you add Krishna, add Krishna to whatever you're doing, add Krishna. Now, Srila Prabhupada, he did, of course, say that wherever you're doing, add Krishna. But that wasn't supposed to be the end of the whole Krishna consciousness journey. That's a beginning. And we're supposed to eventually make Krishna the center of our lives and act for Krishna's pleasure. Many devotees have been initiated as brahmanas, but we're nowhere near fulfilling Srila Prabhupada's aim of a class of brahmanas to lead the world by spiritual knowledge, spiritual strength, spiritual example. Most of those who are brahman initiates, uh, they, they can't contribute to creating a class of brahmanas who can lead the world by being spiritual leaders because they don't, their activity is not as spiritual leaders. They're employees. From the Varnashram perspective, most of those who initiate as brahmanas are technically sudras because they're employees, and a few are vaishas. Srila Prabhupada wanted cultural conquest, that Indian culture and the essence of Indian culture being pure devotion to Krishna. Indian culture, Srila Prabhupada brought uh, dhotis, saris, Indian-style food, deity worship, chanting mantras. This is all from a sociological perspective or a general perspective. Indian culture, Srila Prabhupada brought all these things. Now, some people say, well, Prabhupada didn't bring dhotis and saris. Well, how did we get it then? How did we get the idea? It just... It just just magically we woke up with dhotis. And definitely Srila Prabhupada wanted that and approved that. Uh, so Srila Prabhupada wanted cultural conquest, but un most unfortunately and practically offensively, because Krishna's culture is the Vedic culture, there are Western devotees who are practically openly averse to Indian culture, they have an open disdain for the culture and traditions of India and for those who try to uphold them. On the other hand, in India and overseas, many Indian devotees are, are right behind this nationalistic political agenda, which the way it's going, it's definitely better than other mainstream political currents in India, which are against the traditions of India, the, the religious traditions. But the nationalistic, religious come political agenda, it's not Srila Prabhupada's agenda or Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's gen agenda. Another topic, this is a huge one, which I'm not going to get into there. I'm not going to cover all the topics because there's so many things. But Within ISKCON, the principle of respect for authority is much reduced, and there are historical reasons for that. Okay, let's get to the most basic thing. Hare Krishna movement, Kirtan. Kirtan was, of course, introduced to the West 
by Srila Prabhupada. Uh, nowadays, there are many non-devotee kirtaniyas who do kirtan as a kind of quasi-spiritual entertainment. The, the kind of kirtan that Srila Prabhupada introduced us to, the, Srila Prabhupada's kirtan style, is now quite rare to find in Iskon or anywhere. Srila Prabhupada's kirtans were quite simple and he, he introduced simple tunes, simple beats, but there was a spiritual potency, spiritual magic. Uh, you, you can hear, you can see recordings. He would be mostly with his eyes closed, sitting on the Vyasa San Jai Radha Madhava, playing the kartals, absorbed, very melodious, accompanied by mridanga, kartals. Uh, devotees got absorbed, as Srila Prabhupada was absorbed. He taught the Swami step, simple kirtan style, uh, very sweet, satisfying to the heart. He emphasized the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. But since Srila Prabhupada's departure, kirtans have changed and moved further from his standard. It's not necessary. Srila Prabhupada didn't insist that we do kirtans exactly as he did. But it's now quite unusual to have kirtans the way Srila Prabhupada did it. And there are various kinds of innovations, changes, additions, speculations, artistic license. One good thing is that in some places there is uh, emphasis on Harinam. In New York City, devotees are going out daily for several hours. They've been doing that for a few years, doing Harinam. Great. In London, there's a group of devotees called Kirtan London, and they're also daily doing Harinam in London. So that's good, but we have to have the philosophy also in place because kirtan without shravan, kirtan without the attitude of surrender to Krishna, it can invoke a feeling of, a feeling of spirituality, but it won't be exactly on course. And of course, djembe, accordions, and so many other instruments are there. Uh, I, I won't get into all the details, but Srila Prabhupada didn't want this. I, I'm not going to... It would become too long a series of talks if I was to read out all the evidence for this. Uh, often the kirtans are... Nowadays there's more emphasis on sweetness and meditative style, and there are different styles, but I, 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 this is subject. I, I'll just say it's, it's different to what it used to be. The kind of vigor and verve that we used to get, the enlivening, I, I, just doesn't seem to be there. The kirtan mailers are going on. Yeah, but it, it's... Uh, I, I, I tell you, I, I'm not a great fan of these kirtan mailers because often the uh, it, it's like come in and feel the bhav, but who's leading the kirtans? Do they do they uh, get up in the morning for Mongolati kirtan? It's going on with the feeling the bhav, but what about the need for four regulated principles, serious sadhana? Uh, unfortunately, I've seen it, these mailers, and it's, it's, sometimes it's a venue for boy-girl sensuality. I've, I've seen the, uh, in the uh, videos, uh, the men are sitting there with their big muscles. They're going to hate me for saying this, but anyway, I've seen it more than once. Big muscles and tattoos, playing the madanga and the women, are, the young girls are sitting quite close 
and loving it, and there's some electricity is there. Even in Mayapur, I, I just not long ago, I, I midday, I, I thought I'd say, I, okay, let me see the Arati Kirtan in Mayapur. That's that's something very nice, and uh, the, the the men were leading the Kirtan. And very close to them were these girls dancing in this very nice way, but very sensual. And definitely it's not pure, not pure vibrations being spread there. Not good. Mayapur also, my Radio Mayapur, Omnamo Shivaya Kirtan. Really? Is this the Hare Krishna movement? Srila Prabhupada writes in his purport to Bhagavatam Kanto 7.15, Chapter 15, text 72. Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu. One should chant about and glorify Lord Vishnu, not any demigod. Unfortunately, there are foolish persons who invent some process of kirtan on the basis of a demigod's name. This is an offense. Kirtan means glorifying the Supreme Lord, not any demigod. Sometimes people invent Kali Kirtan or Shiva Kirtan. I had some email exchange with a devotee who, in England who was uh, concerned with some of these things. I, I wasn't aware. He directed me to a, a, a video of a, a... Well, I later learned by inquiring that he's initiated an ISKCON, or devotees initiated an ISKCON. But I, I was wondering why he was directing me to this, because I thought, well, yeah, someone's doing Shiva Kirtans, Omnim O Shivaya, what does it matter to us? Because he doesn't, the person who is singing, he doesn't look like a Vaishnav, a follower of Srila Prabhupada, no Tilak, no Kanti Mala, a beard, and then no, no, not what we would call traditional Vaishnav clothing, and then he spoke some things in some wishy washy New Age way. So I, I, I thought, well, why is this devotee worried if it's okay, Neo Hinduism? But then I inquired for him and he said, no, actually, he's initiated in ISKCON. I, well, why do, why do they do that? It seems a lot of our devotees think that this is great. This is the next preaching wave. We can attract so many people by such kirtan. And maybe we will, and maybe they'll report having a deep spiritual experience. I saw in, in the video that there were so many people there and it looked like they're having a real spiritual experience chanting, Omnamo Shivaya with this uh, devotee initiated in ISKCON. But then uh, followers of all kinds of mishmash gurus report having deep spiritual experiences. What is their philosophical understanding? It's definitely not going to be that we should follow what Srila Prabhupada said about Kirtan. You bring people in, Chanting Om Namo Shivaya. Okay, we're bringing people people who are interested in a broader kind of neo Hindu idea. Uh, but what are, what are you going to tell them? At some point, you're going to tell them, no, we shouldn't chant Om Namo Shivaya. But I I can't explain why because I have to rush out and do a kirtan of Om Namo Shivaya. <laughs> How are you going to tell them what Srila Prabhupada said about kirtan, Vaishnava appearance? Again, it blurs the lines between pure devotion and this New Age, Mayavad, Neo-Hinduism. Uh, there are so many Kirtaniyas out there, I mean, outside of ISKCON, with so many strange ideas. Uh, some of them are lectures, but they, they may be great entertainers and great singers, and they sing in such a way that people feel that they have such spiritual energy. So we shouldn't be imitating them. If, if it's in the name of preaching, if we don't or do kirtan the way that Srila Prabhupada said, the most basic thing, the Hare Krishna movement, and we don't differentiate between how we should be doing things and not be saying things, well, you say, well, 
they attract many people to to kirtan. But what kind of kirtan? Shiva kirtan. Well, they also chant Hare Krishna. But what are we attracting them to? To something different to what Srila Prabhupada gave us. Do we think that we can preach better by doing things that Srila Prabhupada specifically told us not to do? Another basic part of Srila Prabhupada's movement. Uh, books are the basis. Yeah, there we go. Books are the basis. Book distribution in many areas is minimized in some GBC zones, in some areas where there are temples. They do almost book, no books. They never report any scores. They don't do any book distribution. So why should they be GBCs at all if they have no interest in promoting Srila Prabhupada's book distribution? Book distribution does go on, but it's not like this. I'm reading a quote from one of Srila Prabhupada's letters. Srila Prabhupada wrote that the temple is a place from which we send out our soldiers to fight with Maya. Fight with Maya means to drop thousands and millions of books into the lap of the conditioned souls. From Srila Prabhupada's purport to Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 2, Text 37. In our Krishna consciousness movement, all our activities are concentrated upon distributing Krishna literature. It's not true anymore. Many devotees, they, they join and they, they, they're never told about the importance of book distribution to Srila Prabhupada and to this movement. They may not even be given Srila Prabhupada's books to read. In fact, some successful preachers, it seems, they actually tell people that you, you have to read these books first, my books, or some other, some other books first, and only when we tell you, you can read Prabhupada's books. Sounds criminal to me. It was previously expected that every GBC would promote book distribution. That was practically a qualification for being, book, for being a GBC, with some exceptions. Uh, there was the, the GBC Minister for Education, and then uh, Sruv Damada, Brahmachari at the time, Srila Prabhupada made him a GBC for Bhaktivedanta Institute, which was also supposed to promote books, but this specialized books. But now some GBCs, they just don't have any interest in distributing Prabhupada's books. We can see by year after year, no scores or very low scores, or even they do, in their area, they do a considerable number of books. But they have huge congregation. I'm talking about India here now. Huge, thousands and thousands of congregation. They could be doing a lot more. It seems that some actually dis... Well, Falena Parachita, judged by the results. Some seem to dislike Srila Prabhupada's book distribution. And in my humble or not very humble opinion, GBCs who don't promote book distribution. They should be removed. Put someone in who can do the job properly. Many devotees, they, they just don't have any idea of the importance of book distribution. No one ever told them to go. They might distribute their guru's books, their guru's not very Krishna conscious books in the name of bridge preaching. The guru might even tell the disciples not to do book distribution. Don't go out and distribute Prabhupada's books. You'll disturb people. Don't do Harinam in public. You'll disturb people. Or if they do Harinam, <laughs> this is becoming quite common in the West. They do Harinam in kami clothes. Why? Ah. Well, the gurus may say, well, it's not my fault. And it may be. The, 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 the gurus, in many cases, they don't have any influence on their disciples. And why accept, as, why accept so many disciples if, they're not in, if, if you're not interested to instruct them the way Srila Prabhupada instructed us, or if they're not interested to follow? The mood of, I do it my way. Gurus just become a picture on the wall. If I bother at all getting initiated, 
choose a guru who doesn't demand anything of me, who won't bother me. Just I'm initiated, that's all. In their estimation, a good guru or a good leader is someone who's mature, compassionate, understanding, empathic. In other words, he doesn't tell you what to do, lets you do whatever you like. Your, li your life is not guided by a spiritual authority, but I like what I like to do, what I want, what I think, what I feel. Do Krishna consciousness in the way I like, how I like, when I like, if I like. What have we got here? Cheaters and the cheated. That's a phrase from Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati. The tendency to not try to understand very deeply, but to accept Krishna consciousness at the level which appeals to me, what I, in putting ourself in the center, most prefer to be cheated. It means they're not reading Prabhupada's books. Educational programs have expanded. That's good. Srila Prabhupada wanted these courses, Bhakti Shastra, uh, Bhakti Vaibhav, Bhakti Vedanta, Bhakti Sarva Bhoma. Uh, but systematic reading of Srila Prabhupada's books was a must that was considered required for devotees because Srila Prabhupada emphasized it so much in the 1970s. So, okay, Bhakti Shastra programs, seminars, this, that. But that's not a substitute for reading Srila Prabhupada's books. That is a, a supplement, not a substitute. What we're seeing is that devotees from top to bottom simply don't read the books. Yes, from the top. And there was, there's something called the ISKCON Leadership Forum or something. In 2014, there was a survey of leaders in ISKCON, including GBC members, sannyasis, gurus, and they found that only a minority had read all of Srila Prabhupada's books. And we wonder how leaders can lead if they don't actually know our philosophy. Whew. Hare Krishna. On that uh, point to think about, I'll finish this talk for now with the intention of continuing it at a later, on a later session. Vancha kalpa tarubhyas chakri pa sindhu vevacha patita anam pavane bhil vaishnave bhil namo namaha.